Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody to Back to the Future Containerizing Legacy Applications. Uh, my name is Brandon Royal. I'm a solution architect at Docker. Um, and what I've been doing for the last several months is working with customers out in the field, trying to solve modernizing existing apps, primarily .NET apps, containerizing them. And uh, we'll be sharing some of those stories with you today. So just to get started, I actually want to ask that you use your imagination a little bit. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about going back to the future, if I can get my clicker to work. There we go. Uh, so today is April 19th, 2017, and your container infrastructure and your containerized greenfield application is working perfectly. You've got it dialed in, right? You've containerized each one of your discrete services. You've used the latest and greatest technologies like Node and Redis and Rabbit. Uh, to make really native containerized experiences, allowing your developers to pick the best tools. And then you've automated the entire deployment process using Jenkins and CI CD. So you can very easily and quickly deploy your new features out to your cloud or your on prem infrastructure in really just a matter of minutes. All right, all is good in the world, right? Or is it? So you look at your local newspaper, the Hill Valley Telegraph, and you realize, oh man. I've got hundreds of legacy applications, right? All of these need to be innovated. They're, they're seriously lacking in innovation. Uh, so what am I going to do about it? I could do a few things, right? I could completely rewrite my applications, and there's certainly a lot of cases to do that. Um, but that's really costly and can take quite a bit of time and effort. Now, of course, if we had a DeLorean, we could go back in time and we could try to uh, talk to our developers on day one, get them containerized in their app when they get started. But that's certainly not very practical either. Or we can take our existing application as is, containerize it, and start getting those same benefits that we're seeing in our greenfield applications from day one. So now it's your job to containerize or build a strategy for containerizing your existing applications. Right? And this makes it look incredibly easy. I realize it's a lot more difficult than this, of course. Uh, but let's suggest you have maybe .NET applications that are running on Windows. Maybe you have some Java applications, like WebLogic applications, as an example, running on Linux. Uh, maybe you have LAMP stack applications. Um, all of these you need to start thinking about you know, containerizing. And those can actually be really good candidates for containerization, as we've seen with our customers in the field already. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking, right? Uh, my application is no spring chicken. It's been around for years and years, and maybe was even written before Docker even existed. Right? Maybe that was just a twinkle in Solomon's eye at the time. Uh, but you now need to build a strategy to containerize those applications. So don't worry. We're actually going to be talking about some of the steps and considerations in containerizing those apps uh, today. And we'll talk about some of the successes we've already seen with customers uh, going through this process. So once you've actually containerized your application, what are some of the benefits that you can expect to see? All right, ben talked about this this morning. There's a ton of really great benefits you can get just by taking your existing application, not making any changes or minimal changes to the source code um, that you can get. Things like portability. So if you have a project where you're taking your existing application and you want to move it into updated infrastructure or you maybe want to move it into the cloud, uh, we're seeing uh, great benefits in terms of application portability. Uh, security. So we talked about security for the last couple of days. Lots of really cool innovations in security with Docker. Um, those security features you can get by containerizing your apps, of course. And then efficiency. And efficiency is really huge, right? So we're seeing infrastructure efficiency, so the ability to run more applications within your existing infrastructure. Um, and the MetLife team, they talked about that. The Visa team talked about it as well. Um, lots of efficiency you can get out of your uh, existing infrastructure by containerizing your legacy apps. And then operational efficiency is a huge part of that as well. So being uh, much more agile and, and fast in deploying your application features. So how do we go ahead and get started? Um, we'll bring you through some of the sort of high level steps. Uh, but more importantly, actually, want to bring some customers onto the stage and have them share their perspective of how they're taking their existing applications, their Java applications, and their .NET applications, uh, what are the methodologies that they're putting into place to uh, containerize those applications, and what's the immediate value that they're already seeing even very early on in their projects with containerized existing applications. Now, just to give you a sense of sort of what the process looks like from a high-level perspective, it uh, starts with identifying the right application, right? And we've seen with customers identifying the right application to start with first is really critical. Uh, we're also seeing, uh, you know, containerization. You can containerize your application a number of different ways. Um, there's tooling that we're going to talk about today called Image Docker, and you guys saw it in the keynote this morning. Uh, we'll talk about how Image Docker is a tool for both Linux and Windows can help you more quickly containerize your existing applications. 
And then ultimately you want to configure and secure your application, compose that application, and then ultimately deploy it. So let's talk about identifying that right application first. So the key is if you can align to existing initiatives, right? We've seen customers that are already moving to the cloud, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, or maybe they're already, you know, they're doing uh, refreshes of their hardware. So if there's alignment you can take to existing initiatives to drive some containerization of your existing applications, there's huge value in that. Um, you also want to try to align with framework compatibility, right? And that's, of course, much easier said than done. Uh, but as an example, right, we're doing really good alignment with .NET Framework. Uh, so .NET Framework 2.0 and above, uh, we're seeing you know, WebLogic with Oracle and a number of other frameworks that are compatible with containers as is, and you can go and grab from the Docker store. Um, and then looking at architectural fit. Uh, again, starting really simple with those first set of applications, we're seeing customers look at you know, the two or three tier applications to start with, and then sort of expanding out from there. And then what are those little implementation details, right? So a lot of smart people in the room who understand Docker and application architecture incredibly well. Right? What are those little things you need to watch out for uh, so you don't want to trip up in your containerization initiative? So what are those little go, maybe refactor sort of details? Um, so things like persistent data. Um, so that's really uh, common, obviously, in, in application, uh, you know, legacy application infrastructure, uh, where you have to manage that persistent data. Um, and there are cases in which, you know, if you can use existing volumes, or you can even externalize all that data persistence, um, that's really the way to go. Um, utilizing existing build scripts. So we have customers that have been using things like MSIs or packages or a number of other scripts that they're already using to deploy their applications. Utilize those resources and then refactor those over time. Um, and don't be afraid of registry hacks and utilizing phantom uh, DLLs or the things like that in Windows. Um, you are going to be carrying, of course, some of your technical debt. Uh, so, so obviously be cautious of those kinds of exercises. But we have plenty of customers who say, this is the way that I deploy my application. I've got to modify this registry key or something like that. Uh, continue to do that. You're going to see it in your, uh, your Docker file. And you know that's something you can certainly clean up as you continue to iterate on your application. Um, you know, things you want to consider refactoring for, um, session state's a big one. Uh, so we're seeing that in applications, uh, you know, pretty much across the board, right? So if you have uh, in-process session state, if you have an opportunity to externalize that and refactor that capability, that's, uh, that's something to start with. And then anything with, you know, GUIs and, you know, the logging is really an obvious one for everyone in the room here. So you've selected the right application, you're ready to containerize. How do you go about doing it? So of course you can just create your Docker file, right? And everyone's very familiar with that, obviously. Um, or you can use a tool, um, a tool that actually we maintain called Image to Docker that you saw a preview of this morning. Uh, Image to Docker effectively comes in two flavors. It comes in a Windows version using PowerShell, um, and it comes in a Linux version that actually is built on top of Docker. Um, and it helps you to identify artifacts and then pull them directly into a Docker image very quickly. Um, so the example that I'll show you is an ASP.NET application. So here's an example. If I were to point to uh, a virtual hard disk that contains an ASP.NET application, uh, this is actually what the image docker tool will show you. Um, so you know, it's selecting things like the right base image, so the ASP.NET Windows Server core base image. Um, it's doing things like you know, adding registry keys. And then it's even identifying IS features that we need in order to run our application. Now, of course, this isn't going to be perfect, right? A lot of legacy applications, it's not going to catch all the little dependencies. Um, so it does require a little bit of human intervention in some cases. But a lot of applications like this one, um, simple one run of the command, uh, and then you're off and running. Quite a few things that caught there, as you can see. All right, um, configuring your application. So this is one of these sort of awkward kind of hack things you got to often do with legacy applications, right? We're used to these 600 lines of XML configuration files that exist in our legacy apps. How do we map that to more modern ways of configuration management? Um, and there's a few different approaches that customers are taking in the field currently. Um, you can map your existing configurations, uh, so things that you would put in an environment variable or a secret, and you can do that uh, and just swap it essentially in real time. Um, you can utilize uh, configurations to actually swap out the XML files, so build those into your images. And then basically at runtime, you can select the appropriate XML file based on your environment. Uh, obviously, the most ideal scenario is actually refactoring your application to be able to consume those environment variables and secrets. Or of course, you can just mount that using a volume as everyone's pretty comfortable with. And then composing and deploying your application. Um, so this is actually probably the most familiar to all the folks here, right? There's really nothing different in terms of the structure of your app stack uh, for a legacy application uh, versus a greenfield application that we showed earlier. Um, the primary difference is, you know, things to kind of keep in mind. Your images are tend images will tend to be very large. 
Uh, so you'll see you know, images, in, especially in the Windows world, in the number of gigs. So if there's an opportunity to optimize those using things like multi-stage builds, definitely take advantage of that. Um, and then DTR caching is another huge one. So that's actually a feature of the Docker Trusted Registry that helps you to optimize the pull and push performance of your images. Um, there's actually a talk later on uh, this afternoon by Nico, who's going to talk about DTR configuration and caching if you're interested in checking that out. Um, and then take advantage of those security features. Um, so you know, lots of lots of cool security that we security features that we've been talking about for the last couple of days. And there's a lot of advantages that you can get by adding those additional layers of security onto your existing application. So definitely take advantage of image signing and image scanning. So uh, Microsoft IT, or Microsoft in general, actually, um, has been, been doing a ton of really innovative stuff with Windows containers uh, and uh, and Docker EE. Um, I'd actually like to bring up to the stage Rohit Tadachar uh, of Microsoft IT to talk a little bit about how they're using Docker EE to lift and shift their existing .NET applications. Rohit? Thanks, Ben. Thank you for the introductions, Ben. Uh, I work for Microsoft, Microsoft IT. Uh, you might have heard about the small cloud called Azure. That's our playground. Our team really is uh, a software engineering team that focuses on all things infrastructure. And for us, infrastructure is the cloud, it's Azure. So we get to play around with things that are just being released by the product team. Also, we've been working on this for quite some years that makes us have a lot of legacy and sustained applications, a huge portfolio, which is really what I'll be talking about today. Microsoft IT is one of the largest IT shops in the world. We have close to about 3,000 applications uh, spanning across what we call business units, about 10 business units. These are really functional units, uh, finance, HR, et cetera. Uh, transactions going into billions of dollars uh, on a monthly basis. So the, the complexity and the challenges that this brings is both unique to our ecosystem and in many ways generic. And all the challenges that we have seen, uh, we've been able to, to address them successfully. Today I'm, I'm here to talk about one such journey that we have recently undertaken towards containerization uh, and our journey with Docker. So one of the focus areas over the last few years at uh, Microsoft and Microsoft IT has been uh, our, our movement to the cloud, movement into Azure. So we have looked at uh, a lot of scenarios where we've closed on data centers and moved entire workloads into Azure. As part of this move, we've seen that a majority of our applications uh, really kind of belong to what we call legacy. Uh, legacy applications are critical to our functional units, but they don't have a, a path forward into modernization, hence the term legacy, really. All of these applications essentially today are uh, on a VM, could be on an on-prem VM, or could be an IS VM on the cloud. And almost 100% of these applications have traditional and enterprise components that we have to deal with uh, and consider as part of our journey to migrating to the cloud. So with all these complexities, we were really at a crossroads to, to see what we should do. Should we just take our VMs and put them on an IaaS cloud and say, hey, we migrated to the cloud? Or should we look at some other options? And here came Docker and Windows containers to the rescue really changed our approach to how we can take our workloads to the cloud in a more optimized and a standard manner, uh, give back a lot more benefits in terms of managing these workloads, uh, provide isolation and other uh, dependencies uh, from a security point of view that honestly was really hard to do in the legacy world. So all these challenges we were still pretty uh, new in our journey, but we've been able to tackle and address them as we we're going along. So Brandon set the stage really well for us. Uh, what, what he mentioned earlier is, uh, is, are the steps that we took uh, in our journey to containerization. One of the first steps was, hey, we have these almost 3,000 applications. Should we just go pick a few and start containerizing? 
uh, not the most ideal choice to give us the best chance to succeed. We went through a checklist, uh, some of the points that Brandon touched upon earlier, and I'll go into a few more details in the next slide. Uh, and essentially, uh, reached out to our business units and said, hey, what are the criteria that these applications meet? Can we get a set of them? And then essentially boil down to having a candidate list that gave us the best chance to succeed in this path, in this journey. Once we had our, our uh, list of candidates, we went to the next step that Brandon spoke about of, of actually containerizing it. Uh, we used both Image to Docker, the open source tool, and more recently, Visual Studio 2017 that has uh, out of the box support to containerize. So both in different scenarios really help making this containerization uh, faster and easier. And of course, uh, just containerizing is, is no good if you can't apply enterprise and security configurations. So uh, again, I'll, I'll touch upon it uh, in, in, in a future slide, uh, things like domain joining, uh, joining to our domain. Again, we are talking of legacy applications, not applications in the greenfield uh, internet first approach, but ones that require to be connected to our domain. So uh, the implications of that are all dealt with uh, through some uh, GMSA and account creation process. Uh, so a little more deep dive into our first, uh, the criteria for selecting our applications. Again, this is a criteria we put ourselves in to give us a best chance to succeed for our proof of concepts. It wasn't, it's not something that's mandated, but uh, it makes the job a lot easier to start. Uh, so we essentially looked at just the web tier or the middle tier portions of the application. Uh, we left the SQL portions alone for now. Uh, again, in a, in a future time, we'll be able to move the SQL to into uh, containers. We also looked at applications that were running IIS 6.0 and higher versions. Uh, .NET Framework, we said 3.5 and above is, is our initial uh, cutoff. And similarly, uh, the OS versions and some of the other things uh, in terms of dependencies are at a network layer. Uh, we also said, hey, uh, any application that requires remote desktop and those, let's put that aside. So essentially, we, we, we came up with this checklist that that boil down our, our application list to a more manageable list to start with. Well, once we had this list, uh, what really containers allows us to do is take these legacy patterns and apply them into modern infrastructure. This is such a powerful and compelling reason, uh, just in itself, for us to be able to take our entire footprint of legacy and move it into a more modern architecture and bring in Agile and uh, DevOps into our entire landscape and footprint of applications is, is very, very powerful. And this has really been one of uh, the main drivers for us to uh, move into this journey. Uh, so again, just, just, this is, is so compelling for us and that's a point I wanted to reiterate and I'm sure uh, this resonates with a lot of folks in this audience. Uh, we also touched upon this earlier, uh, how we do domain joining uh, Windows authentication using something called GMSA, a globally managed ser uh, service account. So this is just a quick example of how you pass your cred specs. Uh, this is available both for single node and multi-node support through Docker E. Uh, again, makes things a lot easier to get your authentication going. Uh, so. We did all this initial work, and now we were at a stage where we could actually see results of our, again, this is, we, we still call this a proof of concept. Uh, this is still a journey that we're going through, but we'd like to share our results. Uh, so what we had out of our initial list of applications uh, were, were 10 applications that we picked and containerized. So uh, right off the bat, we saw that we could easily get about four times of density benefits. Uh, this is a minimum. This is without even applying any of the, uh, the more uh, tangible parameters that we can apply to get better benefits. We saw a, a third of cost reduction. Uh, and I could take this a step further and apply some of the infrastructure, the host, that, the IaaS host, the VM that uh, is hosting these containers. We can apply some of the other optimizations that we have built in and now get a lot more cost saving, both at the hosting level, the VM, and the containers itself. So 
just imagine this can be three, four, four, four. I can, I can spin up a, a skew. I can resize it from a, a D12 to a D24 if, if my compute cycles go off for the containers and bring it down by the push of a button. So I, I'm able to control both the underlying infrastructure that's hosting the containers and at the same time have a much smaller footprint of the container. So this is a dual benefits that we, we are seeing. Uh, once we had the containers going, what the next steps, as Brandon uh, mentioned, was to deploy at scale. We're uh, looking at Docker EE for this. Uh, we're looking at how we can bring in CI, CD, uh, some of the other agile processes uh, to take this a step further, some of the other kind of intangible benefits that comes with the process of containerization. And uh, we're, uh, we're at the stage of being able to productionize it again uh, using applying the security, the We've heard a lot of good, goodness that, that came out of yesterday's and today's session. So the infra toolkit, a lot of these are, are, are things that we're essentially looking to implement within our own ecosystem. And finally, what are we looking to do? Uh, we're, we're moving ahead in this path of digital transformation. And in this process, we want to make sure that we're also contributing to the underlying tools that, that help for uh, containers. Uh, we, 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 contribute to Mage to Docker since it's a GitHub. Uh, we have pull requests for, for the tool. Uh, we use Visual Studio 2017. We, we, we provide feedback and updates to the, to the tool with our usage. So we're helping not only just our cause of changing our infrastructure, changing the way we do apps, but also taking this and helping the underlying tools that, that really uh, help make this a success. And lastly, uh, what we want to do is have a stage where we leave no apps behind, essentially. That we are able to actually come good on this promise of cloud and optimization and be able to say that we were a part of this journey. Uh, we were a part of this journey with Docker, with containers, with Azure. Thank you for your time. Uh, so we've also been working with the team over at Northern Trust. Uh, so I'd like to bring up to the stage Rob Tanner, the division manager of Enterprise Middleware Services, to tell you a little bit about their experience with legacy applications and Docker EE. Rob? Thanks, Brandon. Uh, as Brandon said, I'm uh, Rob Tanner. I'm a division manager for the Enterprise Middleware Services team at Northern Trust. Uh, I want to share a little bit about our journey with you, where we are with Docker and modernizing traditional apps. A little bit about Northern Trust. We are a leading provider uh, of wealth management, asset servicing, and asset management for institutions, families, and individuals. Uh, we were founded in 1889. I would have loved to have said that we're the oldest company here at Docker, but MetLife blew that out of the water this morning. So I'll just say I'm one of the oldest. Um, we are based in Chicago, but we have offices around the world. Uh, and our number one claim, our, our pride is that we offer for our clients the most uh, effective, the best class services and experiences possible. So before I want to start in getting into what we're doing with Docker and why, I wanted to share with you our software-defined data center strategy. And it makes sense to show this because I want to show you why we made the decision with Docker. On the bottom, you're going to see that we have strategic initiatives that we're already starting to invest in. Converged or hyper-converged platforms, software-defined anything, increased automation, cognitive in infrastructure. These are things that are core for what we're building in our data center to try to help us move towards the future. Additionally, we have five guiding principles. And everything we do, we have to match to these principles to make sure that we're getting the value we need for both our clients and our partners. So agility, reliability, security, performance, lower TCO. Anybody in an enterprise would not be surprised by any of these. Brandon alluded to it earlier regarding Greenfield and microservices. Northern Trust has invested heavily into this, creating our next generation application platform. And in doing so, we're being able to create for our clients quickly new innovations and things that are extremely valuable to them. But we've been around for a long time. I have applications that are still key services to my clients, but they're in the traditional mode. And in doing that, it's a little bit more difficult to move at the speed that we're doing with our microservices. But we still want to innovate on those. 
So what do we do? First, I want to share with you what our environment looks like. We have a little over 400 applications. Typically, in the distributed space, we have them between three stacks, WebLogic, .NET, or Tomcat. And our goal was to start trying to containerize these. And in doing so, we're also trying to make it so it's as lift and shift as possible for each one of those technologies. We don't want our developers to have to do a lot of work to try to get the goodness that containers will give you. So why would we want to do this? As Brandon alluded to earlier, we're already seeing three key concepts come about by just trying to containerize right out of the box. Infrastructure efficiency, a foundation for a hybrid cloud, and improved security. So when we talk about efficiency, I should share with you a little bit about our traditional way of setting up applications. Application will come in, they'll say, I need my environment. We set up a nice static environment for them, be it WebLogic, be it .NET, whatnot, and then it's set. It's difficult to move around in it. We can't modify it very easily. It's a little bit slower. Additionally, we have to be careful about any intermingling. Applications will have different needs in terms of libraries. Versions are going to be different. They may have to have a different type of OS. So we have to be careful with that. And what that leads to is a per application isolation. So what ends up happening is I've got over 400 applications, but each one needs their own guest or their own server, and then you start multiplying that out with uh, HA and disaster recovery, and suddenly you have server and VM sprawl. Makes things more complex. Then we jump over to the Docker side and what we're already starting to see. The ability to have a pool of resources available. It's no longer an application has to be given its own world. It's an application has a world for it to go into. It's already there. Dependencies are eliminated in terms of having any conflicts. The developer can containerize their world the way they want it and know that they will not affect somebody else and somebody will not affect them. And lastly, what that gives us is an increase in multi-tenancy on those servers. I now don't have to have one app per server or one app per guest. I can have multiple, and then our density increases. So some things just from our guiding principles. I'm getting better TCO. I'm getting better reliability. Northern is also looking heavily into the public cloud. And we're seeing some value from that now, and we're trying to determine our best use cases for what we're going to put up there. But in doing the work we've done, we've been finding some very interesting things. One we were able to find just recently was the ability to spin up a Docker cluster in Azure in less than a day and deploy an app to it. I can't do that on-prem. I don't have that type of speed. But it does open up another possibility for how we can handle dev workloads and not have to constrain my developers or make them wait. Additionally, some of the other cool things that you've already heard about, it's some of the uh, uh, speaking, uh, speakers from the key, uh, keynotes recently. Docker declarative services. I can set an end state of what I want my app to look like. In my old way, everything was very static. Now, it can be ephemeral. And this is beautiful for us because the thing is, if some node goes down, instead of us having to scramble to try to get that node back up to get us back to an HA compatible area, it gets rescheduled. It's automatically there. No hand-holding, no inter intervention by a human. It's great. Health checks are not just infrastructure health checks anymore. I can look at my application and verify if it is okay. So as I'm doing updates, for example, what they just shared at the keynote recently, now you've got auto rollback. If you're starting to get your application out there and things are not looking good, instead of it continuing on and then blowing everything up, now you can re-roll re it back and you're going to have very limited issues, as well as now you have a chance to try to fix what's going on. And what that leads me to is a complete service isolation, which allows me to have these containers running next to each other and not causing an issue. Whether it's because I set up CPU shares, memory limits, whatnot, I can do this and not have any worries where there's going to be a problem with risk of one doing something to another. And lastly, security. I'm a financial services company. My greatest asset, my greatest responsibility is my client's data, and I must protect it. And just by containerizing these traditional apps, I'm already improving on the security. Northern has invested a lot of time and money in giving us a very robust security world right now wrapped around all of our platforms. But I want to continue to improve on that. The malicious hackers are not stopping. They will continue to find ways to try to get in your data center. So we have to continue to find ways to keep going and trying to be better than they are. 
So one thing, just, just by containerizing, I can limit the attack surface because I've got a minimalistic OS. And then if you start adding in with the Docker EE, with advanced engines, I can start scanning these. So I get a complete bill of materials, a security profile of my application. And we all know with these monolithic applications, they've been around for years, they've been added on, they've had multiple maintainers, they get large. And people lose a little bit of knowledge about exactly what's in it as it moves from person to person to person. So now I get a complete list. And then if I'm trying to move it into production, I can validate first that it doesn't have a vulnerability. Or if it's in production and a vulnerability appears, I'm going to have a very quick way of figuring out what is my exposure, what is my risk. Take Heartbleed, it's a perfect example. How many knew right away how many of them had the affected SSL libraries at that point? Everybody was scrambling to figure that out. Automated patching in the build process. Now, instead of having this VM sprawl, this server sprawl, where I have to do thousands of VMs and patching at a regular interval, now I can just do it to an image and have that image distributed through the build process by the developer and suddenly we're back up and, and patched. It's much faster, much more efficient. Docker notary or TLS signed images, you heard a little bit about that. I can sign these images and I can validate that what I have running in my environment is authentic, it's genuine. And I know for a fact that it was the image that was blessed by the information security team or it was one that actually made it through the CICD process. It's safe, it's right, we're comfortable. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention third party uh, providers or the uh, Docker ecosystem. We've seen some very incredible things coming out from companies everywhere, whether they've been on the expo floor or some other ones that we've met recently. One I'd like to point out in particular that we've worked with recently is a company called Stackrocks, a smaller company out of uh, Silicon Valley. And they're doing some amazing things in this space where they look at security in a unique way and also doing things like machine learning and AI in order to help figure out how to better protect my world from outside threats. Another benefit that we've been able to see immediately by using Docker, trying to provision for my application world in a traditional way without Docker was taking us upwards of 29 days. The moment we started using Docker, we were able to shrink that down to seven days. That's 22 more days that my developers have to do some good, to be able to be innovative, to be able to get stuff into our clients' hands to keep us as a market leader. Additionally, we're already starting to see up to two times in efficiency with our infrastructure. I can put more things on one server and start getting some money back. One of the other things we're very, very excited about, and it was at the keynote this morning, was the ability to have side-by-side -side workloads. We've already set up a swarm where we had Windows servers and Linux servers all under one managed swarm. And we've started to see some incredible things from this. But the excitement can be, yes, I can have a WebLogic world and a .NET world, and I can see them in one single pane of glass, and that is really cool for us. And that makes life easier instead of having to go in like six different directions. But the real power is going to be what it gives my developers. Because now my developers can choose what they want to do. You want a WebLogic front end with a .NET back end? That's fine. Put them in the same overlay, we're all good. And that's amazing because my developer's toolbox just increased by a large amount. And now they can use the tools that matter to them to do the solution they need with the way they feel is best. They're no longer just a WebLogic or they're no longer just a .NET person. They can be both. So at Northern, the standard now is going to be all traditional apps are to be containerized. And as I said before, we're doing it with as best of a lift and shift mentality as possible. As of today, what we were able to accomplish, we've been able to take one of our Tomcat apps and we were able to containerize that with no code changes and have it deployed same day. With WebLogic, we've been able to containerize a WebLogic cluster. So if anybody here is a WebLogic uh, customer, you'll understand what I mean when you say a WebLogic domain. That is WebLogic's way of doing clustering in the, in the traditional sense. We were able to actually put that into a swarm, contain the actual WebLogic domain in the swarm, in swarm mode, and be able to deploy an app to it. No code changes. .NET we're working on right now, and with the new bits that Microsoft has released recently, we're starting to see some payback there as well, and we're looking to get that mixed with 
the swarm mode where we have Linux and Windows by side by side and start traditionally or start getting our traditional apps migrated over to that. In the end, we believe that our developers are going to have more agility, better security, better reliability, lower TCO for our infrastructure team, and better performance and experience. And Docker EE is the way that we're getting there. Thank you. All right, thanks, Rob. Okay, so just to wrap things up, everyone's getting really excited. Everyone I can tell is thinking, what is that next application? What is that .NET application that's been sitting on the server underneath my desk that I really want to try to containerize? So I'm going to throw the gauntlet out there. Go and identify those applications, those .NET applications, those WebLogic applications, those legacy applications, LAMP stack. Um, identify them. Remember to start small. So we've seen the most success with customers where they start really small um, and, and slowly iterate over the process as they, uh, uh, as they continue to modernize their applications. And if you want to learn a little bit more about modernizing traditional applications, uh, go ahead and check out docker.com slash MTA. And who knows, maybe after all this work and maybe a little bit of luck, the next time we go and pick up our newspaper, it'll look something like this. Thank you very much. So we've got some time for questions. Uh, we've only got one microphone, so we're going to use this microphone up here on the right. If you guys want to join me on stage, feel free. Do you mind just using the microphone up there? So I have a question for Microsoft Rohit. So we, are, we have a lot of legacy application .NET going back to like 20 years ago. <laughs> so how do we migrate those? We, it's running on the VMs, basically. Can we migrate like image to Docker and run into the Windows Server 2016? Will it work, or do we have to do, basically upgrade the application? I, I can start first. So uh, with .NET applications, the further back you go, the more difficult it is to do just a pure lift and shift. Um, so we found the easiest apps to start with are you know, 2008 and, and you know, .NET Framework 3.5. Uh, but you can go back to 2.0. Um, you know, ultimately, you need to ensure that that application would run on 2016 period. Um, so there's uh, some dependencies that you need to sort of watch out for that. Uh, but if it can run on Windows Server 2016, uh, then it can run in a Windows container. Yeah, and we could take that back to versions uh, like 1.1. It's, again, it's not the easiest path, but yes, it's doable, even all the way back to 1.0 on the .NET framework. Question on the application identification process itself. So you talked about the kind of applications to pick. Are there applications that you should not consider for containerization? That's an excellent question. <laughs> Um, there's plenty of them, yeah. So, you know, we, we've started with applications that we're a little bit more confident in first. Uh, most of my work has been on the .NET side. Uh, so we've been pretty much focused on, you know, .NET Native uh, and ASP.NET and other applications like that. Um, you know, state management is probably one of the biggest challenges uh, in legacy applications. Um, and not understanding how your application functionally works is another challenge. We, we've you know, worked with a lot of customers and we try to understand their application and they say, oh, well, that was written so long ago, I don't even understand how it fully works. Um, so those, those we see some challenges in, certainly. Uh, but if you understand the architecture of your application uh, and you can manage the state, um, you know, generally they can be a pretty good fit. Thank you. And are there any other uh, things like, um, maybe there are ERPs and things like that that cannot be containerized, right? Are, are, did you think in those directions? Like, Yeah, there's certainly a long list of applications that would be much more challenging to containerize for sure. Um, but you know, keeping it simple and going with the applications first that you can be confident in um, is a really good place to start. And we've seen customers sort of slowly expand their portfolio of applications that they're containerizing from there. Hey, um, I saw the number one third for cost savings. Is that primarily from packing three times 
the yeah. workload that are running on three v three different VMs and exactly. one. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's just from a density point of view, we're not even doing the underlying infrastructure. We could optimize that, but I'm not even taking that into consideration. And this is just as proof of concept. We can easily increase the workload and the density. We just want to play safe, essentially, to learn more. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of DockerCon. Thank you. Thank you.